Let's open our Bibles to the sixth chapter of the Gospel by Matthew. We're in the midst of looking at prayer. Prayer which Jesus practiced more than any human ever practiced on earth, which Jesus had more to say about than anybody else, and which Jesus warned about more than anybody else in Scripture. You see, there are prayers that Jesus Christ cannot put through to our Father in Heaven on our behalf. You see, Jesus is the intercessor. He is the mediator. He is the one who represents us before the throne of our Father in Heaven. There's one God and there's one access to that God, and that's Jesus Christ. And so when we pray, we offer our prayers and they come through Jesus Christ before our Father in Heaven. And Jesus said, you should be praying. Jesus lived 30 perfect years of life praying. Jesus ministered for three perfect years of ministry, praying. Jesus ended his earthly life in a moment of prayer from the cross. And ever since that moment, he has been praying and ever living to make intercession for us. That's a lot of praying. So Jesus says, be careful. There are prayers I cannot put through for you into heaven. That's what we need to study. Prayers are very much like telephone calls. In fact, if it wasn't Sunday and there wasn't a note in the bulletin that says you're not supposed to let your phone ring in church, I would have my phone on. And prayer is much like telephone calls because with a telephone, you're speaking to someone you can't see, but yet you believe they're there and they can hear you, right? And that telephone call goes between you and them through an intermediate connection a cell tower or a land-based switching station if it's a landline, or a combination of both. That's what prayer is like. Only it's Jesus Christ who is the, the means by which our prayers go through to the one we can't see but believe is there. When I was little, I remember the olden days. My kids always ask me to tell stories about the olden days. Want to hear a story about the olden days? Do you remember what phones used to be like? You know, in 1877, I wasn't alive then, but when Alexander Graham Bell, the Scottish inventor, invented the telephone 120, what, six years ago, it was a big hit. Today, there are 190 million wired telephones in the United States. I'm not counting all the the modems and all that. I'm talking about in-home telephones. There are 140 million more cell phones. That means we have more phones than we do people. It's a big hit. But you know what? Jesus Christ is so portrayed in that process of calling. We pick up by faith our hearts and we speak to him that we can't see. In faith believing he hears us, but we forget how the connection's made. When I was little, we used to pick up the phone and I'd hear my parents say we would like to make a long distance telephone call. And there would be a lady Remember, Bell telephone operators were always women. I never, in all my life, ever heard a man until recent days answer. And so they'd get on there and they'd say yes. And they'd say, and they'd give the phone number and the exchange or whatever series of numbers. And then they'd sit there listening. And the operator would try to put the call through. And if they'd given the right numbers and, and if the lines weren't down, do you remember when lines were down? and they didn't go through? Or if everything was okay? And if the party on the other end accepted the call? I can remember times where they'd say, "Uh uh-huh, and we have a call from so-and-so, and and they go, oh, they don't want to accept it. Sorry, sir. You know, do you remember those days where they wouldn't even accept the calls? And so that's what telephoning's like. But the worst part of it all was when the operator would come back to you and say, I'm sorry, I can't put your call through. We don't even think of that now. We just flip up our phones and dial, and it rings, or it says it's busy. But we don't even think about the process. But in the olden days, it used to be, I'm sorry, the call can't go through. In a very real sense, that's what Jesus is saying in chapter 6, starting in verse 5. He introduces us to the idea that when you and I pray, we always go through the one and only operator. He always answers the call, but he doesn't always put the call through for us. We need to consider why our operator, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, would ever have to say, I'm sorry, I I can't put that call through for you. We don't usually even think about that. If we listen carefully to him speaking through his word, and if we'll practice what he tells us to practice, we will never have to get those dreadful words again. 
The rules for placing a call and being put through are very clear, and they're right here in this book, which is, in this analogy this morning, the communications guide. How we can get in touch with and be able to communicate with and be able to always have access to the God in heaven, our Father, the King of the universe. Well, let's listen to Jesus in Matthew chapter 6. And after we get done listening to verses 5 down through verse 15, we're going to go from cover to cover through this book and see what Jesus has to say. I'll read from 5 to 15, and then we'll pray. And when you pray, it doesn't say if, when. That means prayer is a part of our spiritual lives. It's just like breathing. It's just, I mean, if you're alive, you breathe, and if you're a Christian, you pray. So when you pray, Jesus said, don't pray like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the street that they may be seen by men. And assuredly, I say, they have their reward. So that was a negative comment. Verse 6, but when you pray, here's the positive way. Go into your room, and, and when you have shut your door, secrecy is the key there, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, verse 7, don't use... Vain repetitions, beware of mindlessly just saying stuff you're not thinking about, as the heathen do. For they think they'll be heard for their many words. Brevity and earnestness is the key, it seems here. Therefore, don't be like them, verse 8 says, for your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray. And then Jesus gives that beautiful model prayer we're going to pray in just a second. Then verse 14, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Very sobering words. Let's just bow our hearts before the Lord and together pray that Lord's Prayer to Him with all of our hearts this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven... Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We can pray all we want, but if we do not pray the way that his word says we have access, that our requests and petitions be heard, then he doesn't put them through. He doesn't, like the operator in the old days, make the connection for us. He hears us. He cannot hear and answer us if we are not obedient to what he said. To begin our our little look at prayers Jesus doesn't answer, let's turn to Proverbs 21. Go to the middle of your Bible. You should hit the Psalms. Go to the right, to the 21st chapter of Proverbs. And as you're turning there, a lot of you should be saying in your hearts, wait a minute, I thought you said we're going to hear what Jesus had to say. What are you doing going to the Old Testament? Well, if you've read the New Testament, you know that the New Testament says that the Old Testament prophets, when they were writing the Scriptures, were speaking by the Spirit of Christ, which was in them. Did you know that every word of the Old Testament recorded by the prophets is actually the words that the Spirit of Christ moved those prophets to record. So when Moses was writing down Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy under the inspiration of God's Spirit, it was Christ speaking through him. And all the way through the last prophet after the exile, every one of God's prophets recorded what the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, signified And that's what Peter says. So actually, Proverbs 21 is Jesus Christ speaking through inspiration of Solomon. So think about that. Actually, I always tell people that you should make the whole Bible red letter because it's all the Spirit of Christ speaking, not just those verses uh, that, that the red letter people red letter in the Gospels, but the whole Bible should be in red. Literally, because it's the Spirit of Christ in them speaking. So let's listen to the Spirit of Christ speaking through Solomon. This is what he says in Proverbs 21, and I want to draw your attention to the 13th verse. This is what it says. Whoever shuts his ears to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and not be heard. Did you catch that? Did you hear what God said? 
He said, if you refuse to listen to the poor, to the needs, to their hunger, to their, to their, their poverty, their weakness, their, their lack of whatever, if you refuse to listen to that, I'm not going to listen to you, if I was going to paraphrase it. Basically, if you're a note taker, this is what I say, compassionless praying isn't heard. If we who have so much are not moved by those who have nothing, the Lord says that lack of compassion causes him not to hear our prayers when we cry out to him. You know what's so amazing? It seems like there's a sector of Christianity that all they do is soup kitchens and habitats for humanity and rescue missions and, you know, feeding the hungry and and food for the millions and all that. And then there's another aspect of Christianity. All they do is more and deeper doctrine and more Bible studies and everything. It's just the holy huddle. And these people over here neglect the teaching of the word of God. And these people over here neglect compassion and care for those who have nothing. And Jesus spoke to that. He said, this you should do, but not neglect the other. And you would probably find us on this side over here, studying, 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 not feeding, 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 feeding. Jesus says, be careful about that. Compassionlessly praying will not allow those prayers to be put through. Whoever shuts his ears to the cry of the poor will also cry himself. And that word cry is cry out to the Lord. It's a prayer word and not be heard. We should be careful, number one, for compassionlessly praying. Number two, turn over to Isaiah. That's to the right. We always go to the right. Uh, Isaiah 59. So go to the right. And in Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, a second Way Jesus Christ now speaking through Isaiah. By the way, Isaiah is such a monumental book. 66 chapters, one chapter for every book of the Bible. There are 66 books in the Bible, 66 chapters in Isaiah. The first 39 chapters of Isaiah are doom and gloom, kind of like the Old Testament, 39 books. The last 27 chapters are the ones that are filled with Christ. In fact, a lot of people call Isaiah the fifth gospel. There's so much about Christ. So in the 59th chapter of this 66 chapter incredible fifth gospel, this is what Isaiah says in the first two verses. Behold, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. So now we're talking about what God can't hear and why God isn't listening. Verse 2, but your iniquities, there's the problem, they have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. That's a very sobering verse. Two verses, actually. What it's saying is, secondly, that unconfessedly praying those prayers. If we are not confessing our sins, if we are not allowing God through the conviction of his word and the the work of his spirit to make us agree with him about our sins, if we are, as Psalm 66, 18 says, regarding iniquity in our hearts, God won't hear us. Unconfessedly praying. If we do not constantly confess and and agree with God about about our fleshliness, our sins, and how prone we are to lust, and how we often painfully are aware of our sin, if we are not confessing that and agreeing with him about it and seeking his cleansing, that causes us to have our prayers be unheard. You know, the post office, uh, the United States Postal Service, has this storage facility, the dead letter office. It's for people that don't correctly address their letters, and they collect them, and then they finally cut them open and look inside and try and figure out who it belongs to. And every so often, in a little plastic bag, you'll get one of these letters from the dead letter office. I wonder if there's a dead prayer office where God keeps the prayers that we continue offering with no compassion in our life, no moving in our heart for those who have so much less than we do, or that we pray when we are regarding secretly sin in our life and and we in our hearts know that if if nobody would catch us and if no one would find out and if no one would see and if we wouldn't get in trouble we would do that god says while you're in that sinful state i won't hear you and yet we pray and pray and pray and pray and don't even think about why god says i can't put that prayer through we'll keep going to the right to ezekiel it goes isaiah jeremiah lamentations ezekiel ezekiel 14 Prophet in the exile, off in Babylon, tremendous prophet. 
that God uh, put many precious words on his mouth and in his pen as he wrote. But Ezekiel 14.3 has a very, very penetrating word. He said this, Son of man, he records the Lord's words, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts. Their idols in their hearts. What happens when you set up an idol in your heart? And put before them that which caused them to stumble into iniquity. Should I let myself be inquired at all of by them? Am I going to hear their prayers? Am I going to listen to them? No. So we all whisper, you know, to one another uh, and sigh a sigh of relief because we sure aren't worshiping Baal, right? (laughs) We're not with Buddha. So we're okay on this one, right? Wait a minute. The New Testament says that idolatry is like covetousness. And covetousness is when I want something so bad that I just, it just, I want it. And I won't let go of it. You know, there are people that want security so bad that that's all they think about. There are other people that want money and finances and power so bad. There are other people that want pleasure of some form so bad that's all they think about. They're just, some people, they just want entertainment. They just always, they just can't live without entertainment. There's some people that just, they just want recognition. I mean, there, there are so many idols. You, you know what an idol is? It's something that captivates you, that you want, that you become like. You worship it. Our culture, in fact, I love watching, the, as I pray for, watching the picture of the 101st and the 173rd and all these other military groups, and it shows them out in the deserts. Do you see those little tents that they're sleeping under? Do you, have you seen when the winds weren't blowing them away? They were just kind of like camouflage netting, and they were sleeping under those, and I thought, boy, that's a return to biblical times, isn't it? When you didn't have anything to protect you, that one spear, one arrow, one stone, one bullet, right through that little nothing tent. You know, there's some people that are so prone to security, they worship security. I mean, they've got the gun in their bed stand, they've got the rifle close at hand, you know, always ready. They have the home security system, and they just are so security conscious, and they just worship security. Other people worship financial security. But what the Lord says, doesn't matter what idol you've set up, it's anything that takes my place, anything you think about constantly. You want to know what your idol is? It's what you think about after one second of losing me losing your attention, your mind reverts that. That's what's most important to you in life. For some, it's the worship of the lust of the flesh. Some, it's the lust of the eyes. And some, it's the pride of life. But, but if we are worshiping anything but Christ, it takes our attention away by default. When we are not focusing on something else, our mind goes back to that. And God wants that place. And if he doesn't have that place, you know, if you're a computer user and you make a mistake, there's always that thing that says restore default settings. That means it runs the way it was built to run. God built us to run seeking him first. And anything that causes us to leave that place of him being first and foremost is an idol. And what does it say in verse 3? If we have set up our idol, whatever form it takes, in our heart, then God says at the end of verse 3, should I let them, their calls get through to me? And it's a rhetorical question. What he's saying is they won't communicate with me. Number one, compassionlessly praying. Those aren't put through unconfessedly praying, not agreeing with God about our sins. Those won't go through. Number three, idolatrously praying. If there is something that we are actively longing for more than God, he won't hear our prayers. Here's the next one. Let's go to where we were in Matthew chapter 6. And we're just going to plow through the New Testament from here on out. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 5. Here's a a fourth area the Lord reminds us of. And I call this uh, to pray in an unhumble manner. In other words, uh, I made all these words up, by the way. I spell checker went bonkers on my computer. You know, I was trying to correct all these. Unhumbly praying, unconfessedly praying. It just, the computer needed to get saved. I think it didn't like all those words. But but look at what it says in, in Matthew 6, 5. And when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. Uh, They love to pray standing in the synagogues. They just want everybody to see them. And on the corners of the streets, they they stand and and they pull their their prayer thing over their head and make a big deal so everybody would think they're great. No, the Lord says, "I, I don't like that. I don't want that. He says, I want you totally opposite that, verse 6, 
to pray in secret. Now, wait a minute. Does this mean public praying is wrong? And there are a lot of people that, you know, that they say, oh, it's not right to have public prayer in church. You know, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to pray in secret. Well, wait a minute. What were the apostles doing when they prayed? And what were the 120 doing when in the upper room they were praying publicly? And what was Paul doing when, when the people were, were praying and praying and praying? And when Peter was imprisoned and they had the big prayer meeting, what were they doing? It isn't saying that public prayer is wrong. It says public proud praying is wrong. And so when we pray in an unhumble way, unhumbly. Remember a few weeks ago we were looking at the throne of God and the seven geysers of fire and the four beasts with lightning between them. And every time they sounded the word, what did everybody do? Stand up and wave their arms and parade around? No, they all fell down on their faces. Why? Because there's something about the presence of God that humbles us. He is awesome and to be revered. He alone is reverend. By the way, that's why whenever I have a choice, I get calls all the time. How do you want your name on the program? You know, when I speak somewhere, the reverend, I said, have you ever read the Psalms? It says God alone is what? Reverend. I can't take his place. He is to be revered, not me. So I always, you know, pick, drop the rev part, okay? You know, we don't want that because he is. It's okay if you call your friends reverend, whatever. It's okay if it's on your dress labels. It doesn't matter. But in the Psalms, it says God alone is reverend. And we should humbly bow before him. And unhumbly praying causes our prayers not to be put through. Look at verse 7. Let's slip down to the next part of this passage in the Sermon on the Mount. The Lord says, and when you pray, don't use vain repetitions like the heathen do. For they think they will be heard for their many words. You know what I call this? This is the next prayer eliminator. This is heartlessly praying. It's a mechanical praying. When prayer is mechanical, there's no response from the Lord. As much as when prayer is hypocritical, there's no response from the Lord. When prayer is mechanical... now. If you are praying, and praying is like talking to someone, how would you like it if every time you called someone on the phone, they said the same thing? Hello, how are you? I am fine. I hope you are fine. Thank you. It was good to talk to you. Goodbye. That's okay the first time. How about the next time? Hello, how are you? I am fine. How are you? I am fine. It's good to talk to you. Goodbye. Would you be communicating with them? Yet there are people that I have listened to for years that say the very same thing every time they pray. You ever thought about that? They just have their... Tape. I think when you ask them to pray, they play the tape. (laughs) It's the same thing every time. Now, we're not supposed to be uh, prayer. You know, we don't have a Geiger counter looking around for real prayers and not real prayers, you know, and, you know, (laughs) your, you know, your, your aren't real. Oh, yours are okay. It should be a personal, a personal thought in our hearts. Am I really talking to someone that I love, that I know, that I have a relationship with, or am I just playing the tape? Again, mechanical praying. The Lord says, watch out. Now, the context, they used to have these prayer wheels, and the pagans had them, and it would spin around. In fact, they still, you can find these in in, uh, some eastern countries, and they just spin them. They go before their idol, and they spin the deal. saves a lot of time. And every time it spins around, there's like 25 times the prayer is written on a little slip of paper and they just spin it and that was 25 times kind of like doing the the rosary over and over and over again they just spin and spin and spin and spin and spin and that's what he's talking about the vain repetition he's not saying that we don't pray the same thing over and over again remember jesus he went and and knelt in the garden of gethsemane and said father if it be your will let this cup pass from me and then he went back and checked on the disciples and then he went back and prayed the same thing for an hour Paul, beseech the Lord three times, and and there's nothing wrong with repetition in prayer. It's mechanical, mindless repetition. It's just play the tape again. Brother so-and-so, would you pray? Out comes the same thing you've heard him pray for the last 25 years. And there's no freshness. There's no intimacy. There's It's mechanical. Heartlessly praying. Those prayers aren't put through. Well, Mark 9.29, here's another one. Jesus gets to the heart of each one of us with each one of these warnings. Mark 9 and verse 29, it's what I call unfastingly praying. Those prayers are not put through. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, Mark 9, 29, he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. And he links together fasting with prayer. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to stop eating when you pray. 
But there is a spiritual principle here. Prayer is seeking God, and fasting is denying self and the flesh. And there's something about one who is not denying their flesh cannot fully seek God. And one who is seeking God about something who does not deny their flesh, the Lord couples together and says in those instances when there is a a very great need. By the way, you say, is this only for demonized people or whatever? Well, in uh, Acts 13, 2 and 3, you don't have to turn there, but it says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, The Holy Spirit said, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work. And having fasted and prayed, they sent them out. In the regular ministry of the church of the first century, when they conquered the whole world for Jesus Christ, fasting and prayer were hand in hand. You know, we live in a very consumptive society, and every, everybody is, is basically thinking about self-need and self-fulfillment, and, and it, we're very consumptive for ourselves. And the Lord says, you get tainted by that, and I can't hear you when you're all full of yourself. You must fast. You must deny self. And unfastingly praying, those prayers don't go through. Here's one, another one. Look at chapter 11 of Mark. Jesus goes on, Mark 11. And if you're writing these down, Proverbs 21 is compassionlessly praying, and Isaiah 59 is unconfessedly praying, and Ezekiel 14 is idolatrously praying, and unhumbly is Matthew 6, 5, and Matthew 6, 7 is heartlessly. And now Mark 11:25. Let me read this to you just as it's written. And whenever, Mark 11:25 says, whenever you stand praying, so that's interesting, that's one of the many positions of prayer, standing, When you stand praying, now listen to this. If you have anything against anyone, forgive him. Now wait a minute, look up for a second. Isn't that a little general? Isn't that a little broad? If you have anything against anyone... If you are upset and angry and troubled and holding on to emotional <clears throat> against anyone, <laughs> knocks down your cell tower, is what he's saying. Ruins your connection. Very interesting. If you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you. Your trespasses reminds me of what the psalmist said. If God should mark iniquity, none of us would stand. We all are sinners by nature, by choice, by divine decree. We all by habit are sinful and we default to self instead of to God. What he's saying is that we should never allow bitterness, that that unwillingness to forgive another because we want them to get what they deserve. What we don't realize is if we forgive them, God will give them what they deserve. We can't, even if we tried. God says, why don't you just let go, let me take care of the situation. But if you do not forgive, verse 26 says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. And so therefore, bitterness in our prayers makes them not go through. Bitterness. I think about that. I I talk to a lot of people And there is that person that harmed them or harmed their child or took their job or took their money or whatever, ruined their life, divorced them. You know, and they just, oh, they can't talk about that person without. You know what that means? They got a lot of stuff in the dead prayer office. Because the Lord says bitterness in our praying makes them not go through. We should be careful that we, if we have anything against anyone, forgive them, that our Father in heaven may forgive us. Well, let's look at John 5 and verse 30. We're only going to do a few more. We'll have to finish these next week because there are 20 of them, 20 different times. And by the way, you say, how did you arrive at this list? I arrived at this list by taking my Bible and my, as I told you three weeks ago, my little green pen, and I read every one of the 31,104 verses of the Bible and all 1,189 chapters, and I took my green pen and I marked every time anybody prayed or prayer was talked about. And then if you analyze that and study and pray over that long enough, you'll find this series 
of times and, and many others where Jesus says, I won't hear him. I can't hear him. Here's the next one, which is just uh, one I really like. John 5.30. This is what Jesus said. I can of myself do nothing. That is a profound statement. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. You know what Jesus said? I do not do my own thing. I am dependent upon my Father in heaven. I come, as it says in Hebrews 8 and Psalm 40, to do thy will, O God. Now you say, wait a minute, wait a minute, I thought this was one God, and, you know, what is this? Co-equal, co-eternal, and all this triune. Jesus, in his earthly humiliation, chose to never, on earth, operate other than through the will of his Father in heaven. That's why he talks to him all the time, prays to him constantly, more than we ever pray. Needed him all the time. Why? Because he says, I can't, John 5.30, of myself do anything. I don't seek my own will, but the will of my Father who sent me. And what he's saying is, if we have self-prompted, self-driven, self-empowered prayers, God can't hear them. When it's our will, when we do not, as I showed you last week, be like Christ. Remember how he threw himself down before his Father and said, in the garden, not my will, but thine be done. You know, you want to know God's will in your life, you ought to throw yourself down And I ought to throw myself down more regularly and say, God, I don't want my own way. I don't want my own will. I want yours. The other side of that is to selfishly pray. I want this. I want it this way. I want it now. And that's why those prayers aren't heard. Selfishly praying keeps them from going through. Two more. Look at John 14. John 14, verse 13. This is a great one. This is one to think about as you go home today. John 14, 13. Listen to what Jesus says. He's teaching his, his uh, pupils, his students, his Talmudim, his disciples. And he says this, And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. I was reminded of this this week. My, I was not home. My wife got a phone call, and a man started talking. He says, hey, hey, um, uh, is this uh, Bonnie? She said, oh, yes. He says, how are you doing? He said, I'm a friend of John's. Uh, he says, I, uh, you know, Pastor John Barnett. She says, oh, yeah, yeah. And he started talking to her and, and just kept going. And, and the longer he talked, she realized that he was talking to the wrong person and found out there in Tulsa, of all things, there are two Pastor John Barnett's. This other Pastor John Barnett's, one of a staff of the largest church in town, which is charismatic. And so this guy was just going on. He says, yeah, John and I work the healing line together. We're in the bus ministry together. Man, and, but he said, I just heard your oldest son has cancer and, and is dying, and I'm, I'm praying. And the name of, and he just started praying on the phone, just powerful, beautiful. He said the name of Jesus about every other word. After he got all done, Bonnie said, you know, there are two John Barnett's in town. (laughs) My husband is Tulsa Bible Church. And she said, but I'm so glad you called and thank you. And and he called the right John Barnett. But you know what the lesson was? Those people in the charismatic circles seem to have a longing to say the name of Jesus. And because sometimes they might not do it the way we think they should, we avoid that. Because it's overreach. And we get away from that. Did you know I actually hear people in this church pray, and I never hear them say the name of Jesus even once. Have you ever heard someone pray? And look, look, I call it namelessly praying. And whatever you ask in my name, what is his name? It's the name at which every knee shall bow. It's the name of which all heaven and earth is named. The name of Jesus. There's something, I'm not saying magical and mystical, and I know that this is, and and the commentators say, it's the person and the character. I come to you in the person and the character. Of whom? Of Jesus, God the Son. There's something about his name. And namelessly praying, prayers, Jesus said, I don't hear. Now, it doesn't mean we've got to 
be like uh, the fellow this week that every other word was the name of Jesus. But it should be in there somewhere. And it should be the name that we breathe out, that we speak, that we love. It says in the Song of Solomon that his name is like fragrance poured forth. There's something about the name of Jesus. Be careful about namelessly praying. Getting so, you know, we, we like to get so concise that we sometimes cut off some of the most important parts. At the name of Jesus, whatever you ask in my name. Finally, here's the last one, John 15, 7. This is what he says, and I call this uh, loosely praying. So he said, I won't hear you if you're namelessly praying, selfishly praying, bitternessly praying, unfastingly praying, but this is loosely praying. Listen to what it says. If you abide in me. You remember the vine, the branches, stuck, livingly connected? If you are livingly connected to me and my words are abiding in you, You will ask what you desire, and it will be done for you. Loosely praying. Praying apart from a connection to God's Word, a living, vital relationship with God Himself through His Son. Loosely praying. Those prayers go to the dead prayer office. You see, what do you mean by that? I mean that this friend that called this week, you know, they they talk all the time about Jesus and God talk to me. He talks to me, too. Man, I've been been listening to the Lord all morning. Have you heard him talking to you? I've heard God talking to me all day long. You say, yeah, right here. He talks all the time if you listen. This is God speaking to me. Prayer is me talking to him. He talks a lot more than I need to talk, and I need to listen. And so loosely uh, praying is unaware of what God's already said about something. I know people that are praying about stuff the Bible clearly said they should not pray for. They don't even know that. Why, they're one of those Proverbs and Colossians readers, you know. They just keep in the deep things of God. They don't even know what God has said about his revealed will. They don't read the Bible. They don't listen to his voice. They don't know his will. Ninety-nine percent of the revealed will of God is right here. The, The other parts, the connectors, are what you wait on him for, and he makes your path straight and clear and connects, but... This is the will of God. This is the mind of God. This is God talking to me. I mean, as soon as I unfog in the morning and get awake, he starts talking to me. Verses come to my mind and thoughts and things start fitting together that I've read in the night before and what I'm looking forward to reading. And as I, and you know what he said? Loosely praying. Loosely praying. Not connected to him. Not abiding in his word and his word abiding in me and me abiding in him. He doesn't answer. Now you say, oh, I shouldn't even pray then. How discouraging. That's why it, We'll see in Romans 8, it says, The Spirit makes intercessions for us with groanings that can't be uttered. That's why the Lord said the Christian life is nothing more and nothing less than a series of new beginnings. God says, I'm looking at your heart. I want to know. Do you want to have compassion? Maybe you fail at times. I'll give you compassion. You want to uh, have your heart involved. Do you want to be humble? Do you want to deny yourself? Do you want to be forgiving? Do you want to be selfless? I understand that. But you know, once you're exposed to this, you should consciously and I should consciously seek to avoid the things that causes God to say, I can't put that prayer through. Let's bow before him in prayer and yield ourselves to him. Father, I thank you that we can listen to you who prayed more than anyone else, God the Son, Jesus. You who depended so completely in prayer on the will of your Father. You who so often warn us of prayers that won't go through. Help us to be not loosely connected, but to abide in you this week, to grow in our listening ear to your word. And we'll thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.